Hello friends. In this video, you will see a manhua called Beast's Flower. Part 1. Please put a like and subscribe if you like this video. Thank you. Let's get started. I'm too sad to say I'm sorry, so lie And pretend that you're okay Swear that you will stay Keep trying for one day In a village lived a beautiful lady in the fall and a terrible witch. The latter was ugly, with dull hair and bulging bones. But worst of all, her body exuded the most horrible stench. She was known as the Cursed Witch. She kidnapped and ate small children, and her curses were so powerful that they wreaked death everywhere. It was because of him that the whole village was plagued by the plague. The beautiful lady couldn't stay away any longer. She united the people and drove the witches into the dark forest. After that, Peace came at last, and no one ever heard of the witch living in the forest again. So everyone was forbidden to go into the forest. And if anyone saw the witch, he had to get away immediately. That's the kind of scarecrow they used to scare the local children. The witch would come and eat them. They, in turn, just smiled as if they understood. Why was the girl called a cursed witch? Isn't she a cursed witch? What a fool! It was because she stank. And these two were talking amongst themselves about how there were still backwoods villages where mages were called witches. What ignorant hillbillies, except he couldn't just walk away in silence. They were having tea at Lord Valencia's estate, and that beautiful woman was looking out the window, smiling happily. Surely this isn't a dream. Her name was Ariadne. Apparently the rumors weren't lying, since his path stretched even through the village lands. The crown prince was indeed looking for a bride. It was Lord Valencia. The girl, on the other hand, was confident. Even if it was the crown prince, was it possible for someone not to fall in love with her at first sight? She only asked her father to help because she would take care of the rest. What a father wouldn't do for his daughter. But the crown prince doesn't even look at ordinary girls. The man couldn't believe he was even looking for a bride in small villages. What's gotten into him? What an asshole. How dare this filthy lowlife? Lord Valencia tried to calm his daughter but Ariadne refused. She wanted to deal with it herself. The guard was tired of telling the intruder that she shouldn't be here. Before she lied about being the Lord's daughter, she should have washed her face first. Lila stood in front of him. Did she bathe in a cesspool? How could she smell like that? And now the mistress has arrived. Ariadne let the guard go because she wanted to talk to Lila herself. But the man was still going to stick around even if he couldn't disobey. Lila's house was falling apart. That was why she had come. It was the third month she hadn't been sent anything from the manor. She had nothing to eat. Ariadne was angry that her companion was demanding to be looked after. How much longer would this go on? At her age, she should have learned how to do it. A long time ago, maybe she should have found a husband and confronted him with her whims. Or earn a living on her own. Wasn't Lila ashamed to live like this? Ariadne had thrown her a coin over the fence for just buying something except she couldn't go to the market either. Why? Because of the stench. The mere sight of Lila gave me the creeps. Lord Valencia's daughter was afraid she'd stink too. That's why she asked the damn stinking witch to stay out of her sight. She had no choice but to go back. Back to the dark forest. Back to the dark house. The rain made it so slippery that Lila hurt herself. She wandered around all day, but found nothing useful. And she had to clean up sew clothes from leftover fabric, and at least put a bucket where the roof was leaking. What could Lila do in the dark? After all, even if she could use the money, she wouldn't lay a finger on Ariadne's handout. When she was born, Lila was immediately rejected by her parents because of the vile stench. Ariadne had been born a year later, but she, her older sister, had no respect for her. Even the nannies refused to take care of her because of her disgust. As a result, Lila was sent to the barn, away from the estate. Several years passed like that, and suddenly, she saw Ariadne being given her eighth birthday present already, and it was the foal she wanted so badly. Her father had never forgotten what his little Ariadne had dreamed of. The girl, however, smiled gloatingly when she saw Lila and said that it was getting nasty. She couldn't stand the stench anymore. Before that day, the witch had been living in a dirty barn for 10 years, but she was going to spend just as long in that hut. Why should she live like this? 
because she's a witch cursed with a stench. It wasn't Lila's fault she was born this way. What was it her grandfather used to say? Only by overcoming the trials sent by God can one find happiness. It was only her faith in those words that had allowed her to survive here for so many years. But Lila couldn't wait for that happiness anymore. What was that sound? Thanks to Ariadne's efforts, her older sister has become known as a cursed witch, so this godforsaken hut isn't even approached. Then who is it? Patience was already running out. Who dared to mock her? Why else would someone come here? If there really is a god, Lila only wanted one thing. She begged him to send someone who would ruthlessly spare her from this fate. Was it him then? The girl couldn't even remember the last time she had stood so close to another person. It was the first time she had seen another's face so clearly. Even when Lord Valencia visited Lila once a year, she never got to see his features accurately during the conversation because he kept her out. But from what it might have seemed, this young man was glad to see her. The stranger thanked Lila for opening the door for him and explained that he was out hunting and had gotten lost and therefore asked her to take a break at her place. What was she to do? The girl knew she should be more careful with strangers. She had hurried to the entrance in vain. Was he on the hunt? Could that be believed? And he didn't look like a bandit. It was suspicious to rob a rotten hut. The man begged Lila, but you couldn't trust that face. He even promised to give her a reward. Money. The girl replied that it wasn't required and the, the guy could just walk in for nothing. Lila threatened him. If he obeyed, she would allow him to stay in her house for a while. The stranger would rest here and then leave. Of course he agreed. This is her property after all. Did he really have no other intentions? To be honest, Lila wished she could kick him out right now, but it was raining so hard outside. There was no way something would happen to him. She only agreed out of pity. The man obediently sat down and took off his hood. It was so dark inside, and that's why he asked to turn on the light. But she was out of oil. The stranger had encountered this kind of thing often, so it would be worth stocking up on such things, but few people did. What did he mean by that? Something was clearly wrong. Because of the smell, it should hardly be possible to even breathe in here. So why was he laughing as if nothing had happened? It was like nothing was bothering him at all. If the girl didn't want the money, what was he doing? Lila was telling him to stop moving. But what was that? The man hadn't counted on a meal, so he didn't think beef jerky would be enough as a thank you for everything. Why did he sound like he would honor any request from Lila? Such a strange type. Now he wanted to know who his savior was. Who was she? Not a name. Maybe that's what he meant. As it turned out, yes. What was left for her to do? The stranger called himself Firest. Except Lila didn't ask. What secret was he hiding? His manner of speech was also strange, as was his outfit. It seemed the protagonist had heard it somewhere before, but while she was thinking about it, her soup escaped. Virus wanted to know what Lila was cooking. The man could tell it smelled good, except he couldn't smell the odors. Was this some kind of God's test, too? What was Lila supposed to do? She'd had terrible thoughts as a child, and she'd told her grandfather about it. Although he had a disadvantage in the form of constant drinking, but he taught the girl a lot, politeness, hygiene, and other little things. Despite the fact that Lila lived in a barn and faced only scorn because of the smell, her grandfather, though he crooked his face, did not mock her or ignore her. He was one of the few who knew that the protagonist was the daughter of a lord. That was probably why the man was always there for her. God does not forgive those who cut their lives short. If you do that, you'll have to pay the price in the next life. That's what he said that day. Lila didn't believe it. She thought it was some kind of joke, but to put up with the incessant cruelty and not die just because of fear for the next existence, how could that be called life? The protagonist didn't understand much, but he thought exactly that. He wondered if Lila could smell her body odor. The answer was no. So maybe that was God's plan. Every life has a price, which means the odor came from her for a reason. If the protagonist can deal with it, it will disappear. Then it's probably not a lie. Did Virs really have no sense of smell? Did he perceive Lila as a completely normal person? Then how did it come out? The fact that the man had fallen off a horse as a child, and because of the injury was completely now unable to smell, it was like the truth. That acrid stench emanating from the main character's body rendered her unable to perceive any odors. The scent of a burning fire 
or the freshness of nature after rain. She would never be able to smell it. Pierced, on the other hand, wished he could savor the flavor of her delicious dish. Except it was just cabbage soup. So what if he didn't have a sense of smell? It didn't make any difference. He was only here because he needed a place to stay. What happened? Did the man pretend he couldn't smell anything? Vyrst explained that he'd been too careless before finding the cabin which had left him traumatized. Apparently, the wound had opened. The new acquaintance was going to go back to his place and treat the wound when the rain stopped. Ah. But she knew exactly what the look that darkened people's faces in her presence was expressing, disgust and contempt. Could Lila have confused it with anything else? There was no point in thinking about it now though. She agreed with him, but he only seemed to be getting worse. It wasn't like he wasn't ready for something yet. Though no, this girl wasn't ready. Vierce couldn't taste her right now. At Lord Valencia's house, the young men were having dinner, but looking at Virus' reaction, the host thought he didn't like something. Fortunately, the food was impeccable. A good cook was a find and a credit to the host. The guests realized this after trying only one dish, and the Lord liked to hear that from His Highness, the Crown Prince. The man added that he was wandering through the forest yesterday and happened to come across a hut, so he wondered who lived there. Lila's father gave a negative answer and pretended not to know anything about it. Except, didn't he own the forest? The Lord explained that he couldn't have known everything since the area was so large. Viorst was sure that someone lived in that cabin. Maybe he was testing their reactions? Ariane tried to keep quiet, but now she was more willing to hide it. The girl mumbled that a witch had taken up residence there. A very scary woman who cursed people. And what a terrible smell she gave off. You could smell it from the other side of the hill. Even with the power of the royal family that represents God, there is no way to deal with such an odor. Ariadne begged him to stay away from that hut, but Vyerst was having fun. He understood perfectly well that the lady was worried about the imperial family. However, it was a pity that the wildlife in the forest could only be observed, since the girl said so. Then wouldn't it be better to avoid the forest on principle, except that the man didn't understand what kind of stench he was talking about. If he could smell Lila's scent, he wouldn't be able to say so. When Vyrst smelled that beautiful odor that accidentally touched his nose, his feet were already carrying him to the source, the light scent of flowers. No, it wasn't just the scent of flowers. No plant smelled so enticing. It was as if the smell had awakened all his dormant instincts, as if it had resurrected the wildness that had weakened in him, as if it made him an animal in heat. But to be honest, that cabbage soup was disgusting. A dish made of nothing but a vegetable. You couldn't call it cooking. Lila was holding the candlestick. Candles are expensive. Only the Lord and some rich merchants can afford them here. So much for the lie. And there is such a thing in such a dilapidated house. It was clear that Lila had something to do with the Lord. What about now? Vyrst only smiled at Ariadne, but she melted under his gaze. What a pity. He wished Lila were here instead, a low-grade aristocrat who even manipulated like that. The Lord said his servant looked tired, so his eldest daughter was going to see the man off. If money was at stake, His Majesty's servant would gladly fall for such a trick, even sell his soul. Well, it was better than biting a girl to death in her own bedroom. Even Ariadne played tricksy games, and she fell right into the arms of the Crown Prince. What luck. Pierce knew she'd been raised in the love of her foolish parents. Such looks were not uncommon in the capital, but Ariadne here took full advantage of them, what she could, and the adults who made it possible were always there for her. She was similar to Lila, so the man would be lenient, but encouraging the sassy behavior was not going to be tolerated by Viorst. He pushed her away and exclaimed that he would prefer her death. The expression on his face reflected utter disgust. What did she expect? The crown prince explained that he had already memorized the structure of the estate and knew how to get to his room. He snapped and said good night. It was more like a curse though. He didn't like the idea initially. This woman, the lord, and the manor, he needed that scent. The man opened the door and called out to Suri, who was humbly waiting for his master, lighting a fire before he arrived. Fires didn't think he dreamed of being a vagrant anytime soon. How angry he was. Shuri was sure that when his highness became emperor, his dream of becoming the best chamberlain of the imperial family who could support him with all his heart would come true. 
The boy received 500 shillings for it, and that wasn't enough. They said they'd give him more if it worked out, but it didn't. Suri is an old man in the boy's body. Everest added that there was a hut in the Lord's forest where the witch lived. He asked his assistant to find out all about her. The girl's name was Lila. Suri wondered if there was any need for his highness to get close to her, despite all the false rumors. Although it was more of a cautionary tale, what if this witch could really curse? What is her full name? Where did she come from? Who are her parents? What does she do? Since when did she live there? Vyerst wished he knew everything about her life. He never felt sorry for Suri. The boy, on the other hand, couldn't disobey. With that kind of influence, the girl could turn out to be a great mage, so he was going to find out everything. In the morning, he was told to prepare candles and a horse. But Shuri's curiosity was already overstepping its bounds. Tomorrow morning, everything would be ready. It had been a hundred years since the witch hunts were abolished, but nothing had changed. The crown prince immediately realized how she had been treated by Lila all her life. Even the Shuri of the capital reacted the same way to a witch and the village people were no better. She was probably rejected by everyone. She was treated like a witch cursed by a demon, and her parents had probably abandoned her. For this simple and obvious reason, the girl lived completely alone in a hut isolated from the rest of the world. Therefore, she acted like an abandoned and frightened kitten. Lila's past was very unhappy, but what about her? The girl was looking at the coin. What was on that guy's mind? Left the money even when she said she didn't need it. Is this a man sent by God to make fun of her? God had purposely sent someone with no sense of smell to laugh when Lila was waiting for him to return. Just like he said, she was convinced the guy had said they'd see each other again just out of politeness. Just like her grandfather. Well, but now that Lila was alone, she could mind her own business. Not surprisingly, the water was cold but she had to be patient. If she washed more often, maybe she wouldn't smell so bad. That money. Lila could buy not a candle, but at least oil for the lamp, and there would be enough for meat for the first time in a month. But the problem was that she would have to go to the market herself. This man, unlike the others, didn't mock her. On the contrary, he thanked her and even gave her money, and he was not afraid of her. What's that smell? Did someone have something rotten? People began to smell the stench and whisper, but Lila was almost to the meat stand. I should have just asked. The money Virus gave her should have been enough, and she should have told them to keep the change. We had to finish this quickly and go back to the cabin. The girl asked for one pound of pork. The man asked her exactly how she was going to cook the meat. He was so smiling and friendly until he heard the smell of, what was Lila to do run behind her? Someone inquired about the availability of turkey. Luckily, a positive answer was heard. The butcher asked her to wait for a while because he had to serve this customer first. She was so embarrassed that the protagonist just answered the first thing that came to mind. Soup work for soup. The woman, however, smelled a rotten odor as if this place sold spoiled meat, so she left. The butcher didn't understand where the stench was coming from. Was it really her? The man was about to accuse her of the impending theft but asked her to get as far away from his shop as possible. It was a stupid plan. Lila couldn't buy anything before people started to smell it. Now the butcher had pushed her, and he recognized her as a witch. Other people got involved. It was definitely her. Dull blonde hair and ugly looks, and that stench. They begged me not to curse them. Nothing new. Everyone ran away. No one thought to lend a helping hand. Lila told the man to give her the meat she was going to buy. He didn't even ask for money, except the protagonist wasn't a thief. She gave two shillings and would even have change left over. Now he regretted having been rude to her. When the girl returned to her house, there was a guest waiting for her, who noticed her tears. Lila didn't give a clear answer and just ran away. Why was this man here? She stepped inside and tried to recover her confused breathing. What is this? Was Vire stalking her? Why had he come back here in the first place? What did he want with her? The man stepped closer and touched her curls. He was just concerned that such a beautiful girl was living all alone. Lila, however, knew that was a lie. She didn't think she was beautiful. And more than that, there was nothing about her that could attract a man. Couldn't be. He was a pervert. Why would he think that? What about her scent? 
Pierce didn't understand what kind of smell he was talking about, so he quickly changed the subject. He wanted to give something to her. Last time, the man was worried because it was dark in here. He was worried that the girl never took the oils. For that reason, he wanted to bring them himself. Candles. And so many of them. Last night, Surrey had taken all the candles from the Lord's estate. They would most likely have to eat in the dark tonight, but that didn't concern the Crown Prince now. That's even better. Viersch wanted to admit that when Lila had let him in a couple days ago, it was as if he had met a savior. It was pouring rain, and he was lost because it was his first time here, and he'd missed his companions. Just wandering through the woods, and he thought he was going to die of cold. The man was grateful that the protagonist let him in, melted the stove, and fed him warm soup. That's why he wanted to return the favor. He kept thinking about the soup, but it was still too much. In that case, the crown prince forgave this strawberry. It looked very appetizing. Where did she buy it? Lila picked it herself. Viorce, on the other hand, was sure that the strawberries were very tasty, simply because it was picked by a cute girl. What kind of nonsense did he keep saying? And why would he say that? The crown prince still managed to find out a few facts about this poor girl. One, if you called her cute or pretty, she was angry. Two, if she got something, she tried to repay it, or if she wanted something, she was willing to sacrifice something. He glowed at the sight of her. And third, when the crown prince smiled, Lila would avert her gaze. Right now, this hut was filled with Lila's scent, a bright yet seductive fragrance. Which part of her body would bite first? The girl didn't realize that the uninvited guest kept closing his eyes. He seemed a little tired. His gaze fell on Lila's arm. She had probably hurt herself when she fell. The crown prince was worried that the wound was serious. It must have been very painful. And he touched her. No one had ever done that before. The girl, as Virus noticed, hadn't even applied any ointment. What was it? He licked her. What was this weird guy doing anyway? Was he amused by this? Virus replied that normally people treated with saliva. Usually. That's a load of crap. The man would just remember Shuri's words. The crown prince called a doctor even when he just pricked himself on a flower. Wouldn't it be easier to use saliva? But the girl who lived alone in the forest didn't know about such a thing. Is she really the Lord's daughter? Lord Valencia's daughter, who was born with the curse of percussive odor. It became known that she had lived on the estate when she was young. But when she grew up, after nine years she was no longer here and Lala wasn't even of age. Just one day, she started living in a cabin in the woods. Because of the nickname Witch, she never had any friends. But the fact that even her family rejected her is weird. Well, at least the crown prince got a chance to taste her. Sweet, just as he thought. Lila's blood is just like her scent, fragrant and delicious. And it was driving him crazy, he wanted more. The man pulled her to him and hugged her. When he looked at her, it was like he became someone else. Viorst asked her to come with him. The man promised her he would get her out of this damn ditch, and then he would succeed. On the first day at the cabin, the protagonist couldn't sleep. Because of the darkness of the forest, nothing could be seen. She cried, and the thunder sounded to her like a punishment, and then the girl realized everything that was happening to her before and now. She could only cope with it herself. Did someone care when she was in pain? Someone sympathized with her suffering? Didn't yell that Lila was dirty or talk to her while holding her hand. At times like this, the girl really understood that this man didn't smell. He continued to press in and hugged her even more. So what of it? The protagonist pushed him away. He wouldn't be able to save her. Lila mumbled that she wasn't alive in any filthy gutter. She was the source of this abomination. His heavy gaze fell on her frail shoulders. The girl sat down on a rickety chair and looked at the gift she had received. Although, you couldn't even call it a stare. It could have seemed like Lila was in prostration. In response, Virus was silent and added that he would return the next day because his interlocutor was tired. After this sentence, he left. Why was this strange guy trying every possible way to see her? Grandpa always felt sorry for her, and then he felt sorry for her too, except his words sounded different. What was Lila to do? The next morning, Vierst reappeared on her doorstep. 
He continued to give her a smile from ear to ear. Lila said there were too many. Her favor last night wasn't worth the candles he'd given her. Perhaps it really was too much. The crown prince would accept this favor, but Lila wanted to thank him too. Therefore, Viorz could say what he would like to receive. Well, a plan had already matured in his mind. Of course, he agreed, the guy wandered Lila too. Meanwhile, people were telling the Lord that it was too cruel. How could they be calm? The villagers were now living in fear because of the witch. She had even been in the settlement yesterday. So everyone scattered to their homes yesterday. On top of that, the witch had bought goods from the butcher. And now everyone thought his store was cursed. It was a shame. What is she doing? Lord Valencia mentally thought about the fact that his eldest daughter should have lived quietly in the forest. So why did she make things so complicated? Was it revenge for them not sending her the things she needed? The villagers were so agitated because of her. How dare they, ignoring the Lord's status, crowd in front of his house like this? What was he supposed to do in such a situation? Did the man keep silent because the rumors were true? The guard at the gate, Alex, said that the witch had come here. She also claimed to be the Lord's daughter. Is that true? So that's why he was delaying her banishment. As it turned out, this rumor had been floating around for a long time. It was unacceptable to him. If it turned out that Lila, that is, the witch, was really his daughter, people might leave his territory. If that happened, there would be no one to collect taxes from... Ariane called out to everyone, drawing everyone's attention. She was really sorry. She wanted to apologize to everyone first. The girl even bowed. She explained that they thought they had done everything to prevent the witch from coming to the settlement, but they had not expected such a thing. She was sorry that they had not been able to prevent such an unexpected act, and when the witch came to their estate, they were ashamed to remember such a small thing. Could it be that the witch's mind had become clouded? Wouldn't that be very dangerous? Most likely it was. They would make a decision soon. There were rumors that there were strong mages in the capital, who were not affected by her power. So they were thinking of hiring them, and then they would burn the witch. Of course, it would cost a lot of money. But for the sake of peace in their lands, they would sacrifice everything necessary. Ariadne had given them hope. Now the inhabitants were smiling happily. In that case, could they go home? Of course. Miss had taken such good care of them. Now they had nothing to worry about. It was impossible. The Lord was swept away by what his youngest daughter had said. Ariadne wanted to get rid of Lila. Was she really going to do that? What else was there to do? Ariadne had been saying that for 20 years. Except how could a girl do this to her own sister? She didn't want a sister like that. She certainly didn't. Ariadne and I didn't even consider that she had a sister at all. But still, did she really want to hire a mage? They didn't have that much money. And even if they did, it would be difficult. It was obvious that the girl had said this to make people leave. Lord Valencia let go because it was possible to find excuses for people. For example, a witch could curse anyone. So no matter how much money was offered, there would be no suitable mage willing to come. However, the girl felt it would have to be done someday. As the villagers surrounded and questioned the Lord, he had been afraid of being exposed, but now he was throwing sweat from fear. From the thought that Ariadne might actually kill Lila, his Ariadne, his flesh and blood, his second daughter who had always been so beautiful. But she had been an unusual child since childhood, slowly revealing her gestural side. In front of people, the girl pretended to be a kind and beautiful lady, but the man was afraid that she might suddenly change, even though she was his daughter. At this moment, the prince's servant was looking for Lord Valencia. Apparently, the crown prince was considering the Lord's daughter as a bride. Had his highness himself said so? Or was it Suri's assumption? As it turned out, it was Vyerst words. Why all of a sudden? The Lord didn't expect this at all. His daughter is the crown prince's wife. Then will he become his son-in-law? The son-in-law of the future emperor. And his daughter will become the empress. Suri asked how long it would take for his daughter to pack. His Highness would like to personally bring the Lord's daughter to the Imperial Palace. So, how long will it take? The man jumped up because it was impossible to keep His Highness waiting. 
But Sherry was silent as if he wanted to convey something else. As it turned out, it was because of Lord Valencia's promise. Ariadne held out a red bag, but it wasn't necessary because the man was going to find a good use for them. The deadline was the day after tomorrow. By that time, the girl had to be prepared. Had the prince said what he wanted for dinner and any specific requests, except that Virus already had plans for tonight, and that was his private life. Lila had made him dinner, just like her uninvited guest had asked her to. Then maybe what was on his plate was an appetizer. Then the main course after that would be steak, right? He said he wanted dinner in return for the candles, but it seemed the man was expecting too much. Maybe he should have thought of something else. Lila, on the other hand, couldn't understand what he was talking about. Beers noticed that she was bleeding. How did he get behind her? And so fast, maybe he should have treated her. By that, the guy meant saliva. That was so weird. When his tongue touched her, a shiver ran through her whole body. But she wasn't disgusted. Vyers wished he could change his request. But what if Lila couldn't fulfill it? He promised it would be something simpler. Then they needed to go outside first. Lila took a hard, yet so seductive, gulp of air. Was it because Vyerst was walking so fast? She wondered how much longer they had left to wander, especially what could the protagonist even do for him in a place like this. But if the crown prince said right away, it would be boring. So he wanted to keep silent. Would it be something fun? Fortunately, there wasn't much left to walk, so she didn't need to worry. Lila didn't know what to think. So he'd lied that it would be easier, and here they were, the man had found this place while hunting and wanted to show it to her. There were so many colors. They had such a strong scent that it filled Lila's chest directly. What a funny expression she had. The scent of the flowers. Right now, Viorst couldn't even smell it because of the scent of the girl's body. No matter how much he drank, it was always not enough for him. The crown prince wanted her more and more and even though he knew she would die because of his thirst. But the desire to possess her was stronger. With Lila when she was around him, many things happened for the first time, and it made her confused, but it was surprising and pleasurable. That's what she wanted to say, and now it seemed to her again that she wasn't paying for the favor, but receiving it herself. The protagonist wanted to cook whatever he wanted once more. What was he talking about? Steak. Now it was safe to go back. Was the crown prince really considering the witch? As a bride, Surrey didn't understand how to resist his majesty's restrictions. Vyers had to choose someone from an influential family in the capital, not the family of a provincial lord. Maybe it wasn't too late to change his mind and hurry back to the palace, but Vyers was no longer listening. He wanted to trample these pathetic flowers. He wanted to take everything and tear it all away mercilessly. He wanted to bite her from head to toe and make her his own. An animal desire was growing in him. Yes, and so it was time to go after the prey. The crown prince asked Suri to tell the Lord his words. At this time, Lila was trying to catch the white hare that ran away again. What could she even catch with this old thing? Those horrible people. If they decided they weren't going to provide her with food, they would have given her something better to hunt with. But the trap wasn't broken. Lila couldn't even read. That's it. Don't give a damn about that steak. What was she even doing? Why did she promise to pay him back? Lila seemed to have gotten weird after meeting him. She remembered that he liked steak and decided to catch game with a trap she'd never used. And when he treated her wound, it was so embarrassing. There was no other reason. It was just that Lila still hadn't repaid him so it was impossible to think of more than that. What did Shuri just say? His daughter who will become the prince's wife is not Ariadne. Lord Valencia pretended he didn't understand anything. Uh, if Shuri wasn't joking, then what did it mean? Speaking of which, the prince wasn't here. Naturally, the lord thought he would pick Ariadne up in his carriage, so he didn't prepare them. Except the crown prince's servant didn't misspoke when he said that Virist wanted to take the girl to the imperial palace. He only said that this daughter was not Lady Ariadne. The Lord continued to play, as if he had no more daughters. But how did they know of her existence? There really aren't any secrets from the Imperial family. Ariadne now joined the dialogue as well. The Crown Prince needed the eldest daughter, Lila. Would they really make her a bride? 
In that case, Lord Valencia was going to escort her. Ariadne. On the other hand, wanted to know when Beats had seen Lila. He'd said he'd found her in a cabin in the woods while he was out hunting. Even if that's true, how is that possible? The Lord introduced his daughter to them, and even gave them money. They paid as a thank you for their successful cooperation. But isn't this a success? The Lord's daughter will go to the Imperial Palace as a candidate for the Prince's bride. Except the man is talking about Ariadne. He couldn't even contradict Suri. Or even though she's an abandoned daughter, since the Lord had two daughters, apparently there was a misunderstanding. It's good that even though it was late, they understood each other. But in any case, Miss Lila won't be able to leave today. Suri gave them one more day. And tomorrow, at the same time, at the same place, he would meet the Lord's daughter who was supposed to be here today. Ariadne was throwing everything she could get her hands on. It would be hard to calm down now. How could the crown prince choose Lila over her? Just thinking about it made her angry. Except it wasn't Lord Valencia's decision. There was nothing to be done now. Nothing can be done. So he didn't care if she went to the palace because Lila was his daughter too. Like that servant said, because one way or another, his daughter would become a princess. Ariadne was trying to convince her father that his eldest daughter was a witch. She tried to convince him that choosing a prince would lead to the downfall of their family. Would it really take much longer? Once the witchcraft is over, she will be overthrown. What will become of the family that spawned a witch who became a princess and tarnished the lineage of the imperial family? But they had to follow orders. Ariana recognized that an important member of the imperial family had made an unwise decision. They would inevitably become accomplices when the witch became a princess. If they made a mistake, they would become traitors. Then what could they do? Ariane had already thought of everything. She ordered a meeting of all the villagers. It was time to do what they should have decided to do long ago. A witch hunt? She can't take what Ariane can't have. Somewhere beyond the forest, lights appeared. Behind them came the loud sounds of stomping. The fire was almost illuminating the planks of the house where the protagonist was making soup. It seemed they had finally arrived. Lila was surprisingly calm. This was going to be hot. She had once been sent a picture book from home, and in it, a witch was burned alive. Would it be painful? The girl wanted to face a painless death. But she couldn't help it. This life is much more painful anyway. In the end, Lila still won't be able to eat. Even though she couldn't catch anything, she pulled out some leftover meat and boiled it. And it was all for nothing. In the moments of her probable death, why was the protagonist thinking about him? Vyer st the villagers, for their part, were just as afraid of meeting the witch. Would everything really be all right? What were they worried about? The Lord had said the mages would save them. So why should they? Except they wouldn't come to these lands, but weren't there other ways? And magicians aren't that reliable. Exactly. Even the priest didn't know what to do. Anyway, there was no need to worry. That which is just a girl, is that so? And so as they approached the old hut, the door was opened by Lila. The men exclaimed that they had come to punish the witch, but she asked them to leave because they could do it at any moment. Except that the inhabitants headlong, since gone to reprisal so that they could sleep in peace. But they had done nothing for 21 years. So couldn't they wait another day or two? There was no more patience. But what exactly had they tolerated for so many years? What exactly had she done to them? Had they ever even seen Lila eat the children? Was there really a child missing from the area? Did someone die from her spells? Did she bring deadly diseases? No. Then what did the girl do to them that was so bad? Lila was alive. That was their answer. She lived and stank around them. That's what she was guilty of. Not today. The protagonist asked them to come back next time. What was she going to do? Drag her stinking carcass back to the village again. Or go to the Lord's estate, still believing he was her father. Or he wouldn't give her a penny. Lord Valencia had made up his mind. He had given permission to deal with the witch. Her eyes blurred at the phrase, as she wondered what her father's face had been like when he'd ordered the murder of his own daughter. No matter how much Lila thought about it, she still couldn't imagine it. 
probably because she hadn't seen him in a long time. And now it was time to fight back. The villagers were sure she was the real witch. Why? Because she was afraid of fire. Now all they had to do was burn the witch. But what is this? Who dared to interrupt them? A beast! Where did such a huge predator come from as a child? A man had been frightened by a bear in the forest, but this one was a completely different size. Has it been living here all along? Lila still continued to resist, but the man decided it was her doing. How dare she use such dirty tricks? Was this really the end? Would Vyres come at all? And so the offender was on the ground, and the predator looked at Lila. Those golden eyes did not eviscerate her with terror and fear. She recognized them. The villagers tried to drive the predator away with fire, but their attempts were in vain. Now they were sure it was the witch's work. But she was also curious about the creature. In the 10 years that the protagonist had lived in this forest, she had never seen this beast. But wasn't it obvious? She shouldn't tell them the truth. Now the men were trying to get her to chase the creature away. But she was against it. Though Lila was in no position to comply with their requests at all, the wicked witch. The main offender didn't know when she managed to summon the beast, but if you kill the caster, his beast will immediately disappear. All you have to do is pierce the witch's heart. The hunter had forgotten someone. A huge beast protected the girl and scared the rest of the rebels. They made a commotion and scattered in different directions. From surprise or madness, someone let go of the torch which fell directly on the wooden hut. Lila exclaimed that she had to put out the fire as quickly as possible. Even if she put it out, then what then? Would she continue to live here? Just like before, a man is dead. And those who ran away will blame it all on the witch. A witch who lives in a hut in the woods summoned a black beast and killed people. How will they leave her alone? She always thought she was the dregs of society, but this time it's for sure. The end? But why was that animal staring at her so expectantly? Why didn't he attack her? Lila immediately felt that look was familiar to her for some reason, as if she'd seen it somewhere. It was dangerous to be here. Well, where had that beast gone for the first time except for her grandfather? Someone was on her side, and once again, she was alone. After a while, Firest appeared and asked how Lila was doing. He was concerned because he immediately realized that there had been a fire. Fortunately, the girl was not hurt. At least that pleased him. Apparently, everything had burned to the ground. There was nothing left. The protagonist must have been upset that this happened to her house. Did she have a place to stay? Then maybe she would have wanted to go with the crown prince. He had already suggested that she go together. Um, but why should she suddenly go with him? How could? Her house had completely burned down. Lila decided to go to the manor. What the people from the village said. It's all lies. Viersh wanted to know where his friend had been going all this time. She had asked him not to follow her. He didn't understand why Lila was being so stubborn. Wouldn't it be better to go with him? She replied that she was going to her parents' house. In that case, the man wished to see to it that the protagonist got to them. Would she agree to that? There was no answer. Could it be? Yes. Surely he had a lot of questions. But why didn't he ask anything? Why she didn't live with her parents or why she lived in such a dilapidated shack? The protagonist tried to reason with herself. You can't be mistaken. And so the scent followed. The guard met the witch who asked to summon the Lord. Had he not already heard the news? Would she cast a spell on this place? Afraid? He appeared outside the gate. Father, the Lord had explained that the witch would not harm him. So he was going to talk to her but Ariadne was not to know about it. The guard was going to call the men, so he asked to be given some time. Lila, on the other hand, notified her father that her house had burned down, so she would never be able to return to the hut again. The protagonist wasn't sure if she wanted to know the truth. But she asked nonetheless, did he really order her to be killed? Did Lord Valencia want his eldest daughter dead? It was a truth she had always known, and Lila had tried to ignore it. But hearing it from the villagers, just a moment ago he was afraid that everyone might find out about their kinship. But even as she watched him desperately making excuses, the girl didn't want to admit it. She wished she could, too. She'd been abandoned by her own father. If Lila wanted death, too, then why had she survived and come here instead? Those were his words. 
Her own father had suffered so much because of her. People could have found out she was his daughter, and then their lands would no longer be traded. Couldn't Lila just live there in peace? Then he wouldn't have had to make such a terrible decision. He ordered her to live quietly as if she were dead. The Lord would tell everyone that the witch was dead. No, she wasn't allowed to be here. Is that sadness? No. The sadness passed quickly enough. She no longer felt like her heart had been pierced. Now Layla just wanted to rest. The crown prince, on the other hand, repeated his words about wanting to make the Lord's daughter. His wife, and if the man knew that, then why did he try to burn her alive? Lord Valencia thought it was about his second daughter. Hadn't they already discussed it with Suri? He had a strange feeling because his highness looked different from usual. He explained that his daughter was born with a slight problem, and Lord Valencia was only trying to fix it. Has he really lost his mind? If not, then how dare he deceive the crown prince? What had he just said? The crown prince treated the lord kindly, even though he was not of noble lineage. Not at all what the man had expected from the rumors. And then suddenly, Ariadne appeared in black. She asked to finish the thought for her father. Like the girl had said last time, this witch, her older sister, was cursed. They tried to free her from the curse, but in the end it didn't work and they were left without their possessions. Ariane sobbed because they supposedly had no choice but to send her away from the estate. She was sure the witch would catch them. Did his highness understand? Ariadne wanted to enlighten him to the idea that it was better to marry a beautiful and kind woman than that rotten witch. That he had been deluded all this time. Virsch replied that she was a very talented liar. For a second, he even thought that it was not a man, but a snake sitting in front of him. Wasn't their dare too luxurious to lie about their poverty? Oh, and Ariane herself sat dressed in an expensive dress and jewelry. Was it not so? Besides the crown prince was inquiring about the reason for the burning. He didn't ask if she was a witch, but Ariane could no longer contain her anger. The girl made herself think Lila was something she wasn't. But the Lord and his daughter could not allow this marriage. They couldn't. They not only dared to deceive the crown prince, but also questioned his greatness. Hi. Did they really think they were worthy to stand on the soil of the empire after such a thing? From that moment on, the Lord was stripped of his status. The man begged and pleaded for forgiveness. But in vain, even Ariadne was frightened. She clutched her hands and begged to let her explain. How dare she touch him with her filthy hands? He grabbed the dagger and did the irreparable. Blood splattered all over the room. Everyone surrounded the girl. The crown prince ordered Lord Valencia's estate burned for insulting the crown prince's bride-to-be. Completely. Suri couldn't disobey, even though he didn't want to. It was a terrible nightmare. A truly unimaginable, a nightmare they would never wake up from. Lila, on the other hand, thought it would be nice to die in this place. She had lived here for over a decade, and this forest would be her grave. Today, Lila would leave this hell, except someone was against it. The viewers couldn't let that happen. Did the girl really want to die and leave him here? His gaze devoured her like that, but Lila was begging to be let go. She was a witch, of course the man wasn't aware of it, but she stank horribly. That was the reason for her curse. That's why her house looked like this now. They wanted to burn her down, so she begged him to leave her alone, and not to come any closer. The crown prince, on the other hand, replied that she was a perfectly ordinary girl. Although he wouldn't say so, as viewers thought, Lila was very nice. And he wasn't lying. It was the villagers who were lying, and what did her otter have to do with the girl being a witch? Did she eat children, like the others said? Or was she bringing the plague here? She did none of those things. And just because of her smell, she was called a witch. Lila just didn't fit this place. So Virus just asked her to go with him. Does she agree? Of course she did. From all that tension, how glad he was that Lila had given her consent. Now the girl was convinced that her new friend was an aristocrat. Even on the Lord's estate, there was only one similar carriage. He wore the same thing almost every day, so Lila thought he was poor. Even though this carriage didn't compare to the Emperor's, it looked noble enough. It must have been hard for Shuri, 
because the crown prince didn't want Lila to know that he belonged to the imperial family until they arrived at the palace. There he is. As expected, Shuri could smell it too. The man wished to ride in the rear carriage. Well, since it was his wish, these two were left alone after all. The carriage would be shaky because they'd be traveling through the woods. And it's going to be three hours. Lila didn't even know the forest was so huge. They were passing by a temple. The man offered to stop and pray because then the wish might come true. Did he really believe in God? Who did? Only she didn't know. She didn't have to, Virus called her beautiful. Why did he always say that? Beautiful, sweet. She always thought the crown prince was up to something. Maybe he wanted to sell her to some witch or conspired with someone who wanted to sacrifice her to become more powerful. It sounded interesting, but that wasn't what Vyrst wished for. His wish was, there was a struggle going on in the continent. The war had lasted too long, and the people had lost all hope. And suddenly, like a comet in the night sky, on Lionai appeared. He appointed himself a messenger of God, ended the war by unknown forces and united the continent. And that is how the Onlion Empire came into being. The first emperor ruled by godlike power, and no one dared to oppose him. And even now, 60 years later, that power is still unshakable. So why did Virus need to conquer the empire? His desire is to take possession of it. So Lila didn't need to know anything because the crown prince would get what he wanted with her help. But now, Lila demanded an explanation. What was he trying to accomplish? And what was this place? They had come to a luxurious castle. As soon as Lila stepped out of the carriage, Virus lifted her into his arms. Then a strange girl named Cecil took her away. And there was an insanely huge room waiting for her. And a bathtub. This girl was peeping as she bathed. Except Cecil was only serving, not peeping. Servants always accompanied aristocrats. The crown prince asked Lila to sit down because he wanted to hear her voice closer. This was the Imperial Palace, and he is the heir to the throne, Crown Prince Vyers Black D Online. The girl had heard of him as a cold schemer, arrogant and cruel killer. That was more than enough, but Lila did not regard him as such. In her eyes, he was kind, no need to believe the rumors. The man, however, hoped that the girl would live here in comfort. It was even surprising to her that there was warm water here. What she saw was magic. Magic is very comfortable. It can make the water warm, even make the wind blow. It wasn't God's gift, but magic could even heal people. The crown prince hoped that people would recognize its benefits. Lila, on the other hand, believed it would become a reality. Her words gave him strength. She was especially beautiful today. But in her head, the girl knew better than anyone comfortable that it was only a lie. The more Virus spoke, the more she thought she was becoming as beautiful as Ariadne. Why was her heart beating so fast? Everything was ready for bed. Lila asked Lila about the smell. Of course the answer turned out to be yes. Then why did the woman pretend the girl didn't stink? She had never once insulted her, never once called her a witch. Uh, Cecil didn't know Lila had ever experienced such a thing. She was aware of everything thanks to the prince and only wanted to do her job, looking out for her mistress. Her family had been looking after hereditary princes for generations. It had been her duty since birth. Lila asked her to leave because she wanted to be alone. Suri, on the other hand, waited until she fell asleep. Virus was now ready to hear the report. As soon as the crown prince had left the Lord's territories, his majesty had urgently made an appointment. He was now located in a small northern town. He hadn't given an exact date, but a letter had arrived a couple days ago that preparations were underway for his return to the palace. According to the plan, Vior should arrive in a week. The purpose is to develop the Northern Territories and promote tourism. Didn't he himself send the Crown Prince to the Lord? And now he's telling him to leave. Also in this body so far north. The man didn't know what he was up to. But he had tried to get them around his finger. Even though he had given his powers to Vyrst, he still had to attend meetings and make decisions. Doesn't that mean he enjoys his power? 
without taking responsibility for his actions. This time he left with the Holy Father. What happened to the Holy Father who never left the temple, justifying himself by saying that he wanted to be closer to God? What did they conspire about while the crown prince was away from the palace? Cecil knocked on the door, but there was no answer, so she went in herself. If Lila didn't want to be late for the meal, she should have hurried in, except there was no one inside. She was nowhere to be seen. Did she run away? Then Cecil must warn the prince, if his majesty finds out. Last night, Lala reflected on the fact that her maid had said she would put up with her stench and take care of her. It seemed ridiculous to her because sooner or later she would be covered in insults. So much happened that day, and the main character was tired. It wasn't the first time she had seen this bed, but it still seemed too big for her. And not just the bed, everything was big here. Because of that, Lila couldn't relax. That was it, this place was more suitable, much more comfortable. And now Cecil had found her. The servant asked why the girl was sleeping in such a place. She was already expected, so it was time to wash up and get ready. Would Cecil be peeping at her again? It wasn't like that, but Lila didn't want to put up with it any longer. Just like yesterday, the girl was eating very sloppily. No, she was just gorging herself. Not surprising considering no one had trained her, but his highness was so kind that no one could get used to it. He liked to tease her. Layla looked away from the crown prince in embarrassment. He pretended that nothing strange had happened and only continued to smile sweetly. As she looked at Bast, her heart began to race again, even though she thought she had calmed down enough yesterday. Layla awkwardly changed the subject, asking her companion how she should address him after all. Bis chose your highness crown prince out of all the options offered. The girl who recognized the man's true position tried her best to be polite. She was certainly not like the rest of the aristocrats, but she had been taught a few things as well. The crown prince thought to himself that Leela was most likely taught by the old stable boy, the only one who cared for the girl in the entire estate. Officially he was retired, but Bist had heard the baron's other daughter had actually framed and killed him. Out loud, however, the prince said otherwise. He expressed his hopes that Layla would do what she herself wanted to do here, and if she was used to being treated informally, that was perfectly fine with him. The prince wanted the girl to see him not as a high-ranking person, but as a man named Bayest. He admitted that sometimes he felt as if everyone was looking at him, but no one could see him. Layla did not understand why the prince suddenly spoke like some tramp. And anyway, the girl wanted Bist to assign her some work in the palace because she couldn't relax while being looked after. She had been taught that favors must be repaid. She could only chop wood and mend clothes, but those skills were not needed in a palace full of servants. However, the prince eventually found something for the girl to do. Leila was brought to the library where Bist had been reading and studying since childhood and assigned to take care of the place. The girl outright burst into enthusiasm. The maid held out a map of the library by which to categorize the books. The shelves were divided by the sciences, and it was impossible to move books between them, only inside in alphabetical order. But first of all, Leela decided to do some cleaning, and Cecile went off to get everything she needed for that. The girl, left alone, exhaled, and then turned to the window in surprise. She thought she saw a glimpse of Beastie behind the window bars. Layla thought she was imagining it, since the hair of the man outside the window was silver. But in fact it was Beastie's uncle, the Archduke Lumiere. He had arrived here after a long time, specifically in the absence of Clark Baines de Leon, the current emperor, as he was not happy with the man's frequent visits to the palace. And when Lumiere arrived at Beister's, he heard the maids whispering about the woman the crown prince had brought with him. Was he really going away to fetch her? So the Archduke burst into his nephew's office, and from the threshold he was indignant at his action. What the hell does the prince need this woman? That's what tormented Lumiere. He thought it was not too late to send the girl back to where she had come from. Beast had jumped up, barely hearing that his uncle had seen Layla without his permission. He ordered the guards to escort the Archduke out of the palace without listening to his exhortations. Lumiere asked Flora sorrowfully to himself, what should he do now with this boy? The prince chatted peacefully with a girl who was interested in the rumors of Bist bringing a woman with him. 
They spread with surprising speed, most likely because His Highness did not try to hide it, even from his fiancée with whom he was now actually communicating. It was Elizabeth Rymont and technically, she was not yet a bride, but was merely trying to provoke the prince. But the girl wasn't too patient, and Bist easily parried the attempt by pointing out that the engagement was just pending. Frankly speaking, the prince did not understand why he would marry the daughter of Count Rimeth, whom he did not consider trustworthy. But this man's family was second only to the imperial family. In wealth, the version that the count was trying to raise his status in this way was also not fully believed. Besides, the emperor himself, for whom the honor of the Onlan family was most important, insisted on this engagement. But why would he want to make another nobleman stronger? Elizabeth returned to the original topic of discussion. The woman brought in. She tried to press the point that the prince's guest reeked horribly of some unknown contagion, or in general was really a witch who had gotten close to base to cast a curse. Just a baron's daughter from the countryside, who should have been gotten rid of as soon as possible. His Highness, unable to withstand the flood of nonsense from the lips of his interlocutor, rose from his seat. The noblewoman tried to get indignant at the insults, because she was a future princess, but the prince cut her off. He put the girl in her place, reminding her that ordinary aristocrats should not interfere in the affairs of the imperial family. The crown prince had the right to bring anyone and make any decisions he wanted, and everyone else, including Elizabeth herself, had to remain meekly silent. Finally, Bist advised the girl in an ordered tone to concentrate on restoring her health before the engagement. Count Rimoth's daughter left in anger. The crown prince ordered her to leave the palace immediately in a prepared carriage and not to leave her home until after the engagement. This rude treatment offended Elizabeth, and she couldn't just leave here deciding to make a few visits before she left. Layla stretched blissfully. She had almost finished cleaning up and now she had to start arranging the books. This worried her as Layla couldn't read and it would be very noticeable. Unconsciously, the girl began to chew on her nails and immediately shuddered when she felt the unpleasant taste. Her nails were painted by Cecil, and not only them, a maid had washed Layla's hair with warm water and oiled it so that it was soft and her skin was now smooth too. In addition, the girl had been strikingly thin before, but now she had gained some weight. Would Beastie say to this that she was a beautiful and lovely mistress? The library doors swung open with a slam. Layla's unfamiliar mistress in the doorway immediately cringed at the foul odor. She had knocked the girl a bit out of her element with her appearance and words. Layla had gotten used to the hateful stares of other people during her stay in the palace. The unexpected guest of the library introduced herself as the crown prince's fiance. She had come to warn Layla not to do anything foolish without knowing the measure. At the same time, Elizabeth caustically remarked that the girl was just a temporary toy which the prince would not even want to look at after a while. After that, the count's daughter wanted to leave, expressing her hope never to meet someone like that again. However, Leela stopped her by asking her back if she loved Baist. The noblewoman turned around in surprise and suddenly laughed loudly at the naivety of the question. Of course she didn't love the crown prince. There was no denying that his highness was good looking, but Elizabeth would marry him even if he was a filthy pig. All she wanted was to become empress and rise above everyone else. Elizabeth would do anything for that. She didn't give a damn about Basti's happiness. Leela's fists clenched at that answer. With anger, she forcefully pushed the aristocrat's chest to the floor. Elizabeth flew to the floor, but immediately jumped up and threatened to call the guards. As before she could carry out the threat, she remembered the crown prince's order to stay out of her house until the engagement party and gritted her teeth and decided to leave. Lastly, she threw Layla a glare that she would not get away with this prank. Then, heels clacking furiously, Elizabeth walked away. Layla resolutely opened the library doors and went in search of Beist, as she urgently needed to find out from the prince personally if that girl was really his fiancée. If it was true, she had to tell him that his fiancé was a very strange person who also did not like her fiancé all. But suddenly she was stopped by the laughter of the servants. They were discussing Lele, not believing that someone like her, so vile and with a stench coming from her body, would really become the prince's woman. 
they truly believed that such a mediocre, ugly, and poor girl would quickly bore his highness. Some of them even thought she was a beggar, instead of an aristocrat when they first met. Then the maid smelled an odor that resembled coming from Layla. They decided to check and went out into the hall, but there was no one there. At the meal with the crown prince, Layla looked gloomy and was so absorbed in her thoughts that she did not even respond to Beiste's call the first time. When asked how she was feeling, she evasively said that she was fine. It was clear from the look on his highness face that he did not believe these words at all. At night Layla went out on the balcony, looking thoughtfully into the distance. She was accompanied by Beiste, who came out with a cup he offered the drink to the girl, but she refused. She had been in a bad mood for days and it bothered Beiste. The fact was that when Layla heard those maids talking, she could only run away. After all, they were, in her opinion, telling the truth. There were those things she wanted to say and ask Beiste, but did the girl have the right? Layla thought over the fact that it might be better for her to silently leave this place. However, she didn't want to disappear like that. The girl wanted to be close to Beiste. So Layla grabbed the prince's sleeve and told him that Elizabeth did not love him. And then the girl asked if he loved his fiance. Beast only smiled sadly. So we look forward to your comments about this story to not miss new videos. Please subscribe to notifications. Thanks for watching.